So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the day. Thank you for the time of year where we celebrate the birth of Jesus, where we celebrate the gift you gave us and our Savior, and that he became flesh and dwelt among us to give us life. And I pray, Father, you draw us to you this morning, speak to us through the text, encourage us, and convict us, Father, of our responsibility to serve you, to make known to the world around us that Jesus is our Savior, and give us a heart and desire, Father, for you and to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1. The believer, you and I, have a responsibility to tell our Christmas story. And by that I mean, when I come to know who Jesus is and respond to Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, and turn my life to him, invite him into my life, into my heart, takes away my sin, I'm his, he is mine, we are one, I'm saved. Well, I have a story, and that story literally is my Christmas story. It's when Christ came to me, convicted me, and saved me. So we have a responsibility to share that story wherever God places us, whoever God places us with. And we'll use John the Baptist this week and probably next week as an example of doing that, of sharing that story, of sharing our testimony of Jesus. So chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And then beginning in verse 15. John testified about him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness... We have all received in grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Who is John? We know John's dad was Zacharias, a priest, one of the reigning, not reigning priests, but one of the major priests in the Jewish system because he was in the temple giving sacrifices, burning incense when the angel spoke to him and said, you'll have a son. So he was a, a serving priest in the temple, which is high of rank. So John could have been that as well as that as his son. What I want to point out from the text, though, is verse 6, came a man sent from God. John was sent from God. We haven't been in the Testament for a while, so I'll remind you of the perfect tense which is the action then, action now, and action forever. John has been, was, and is sent by God. It's that calling that never goes away, if you will. Um, John was chosen by God, we know, because of his birth record in Luke, but also the text says here, God sent him. John spent his whole life being sent by God to bear testimony of Jesus. That's exactly what he did. And I believe our sending is similar when we are saved, when we surrender our life to Jesus, he sends us. It may be on a small scale, we think, or a large scale, we think. Regardless, he sends us, and that sending is a permanent state of being. We are always going out to represent Jesus wherever he sends us or he places us. So John was sent as a witness of Jesus. Well, as a believer, you and I are also sent as a witness of Jesus. And we go and tell our account of Jesus. We tell the world what we experienced with Jesus, in him, through him, all that he's done for me, that is our testimony. Uh, John wants to testify of the light of Jesus. Um, that is emphasized because it says that John was not the light. Verse 8, he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And we could spend some time on verse 8. Um, we are sent to testify of the light. The light is Jesus. I am not sent to testify of me or about me. I bring the light of Jesus to every room I enter because he is in me. I am always testimony for Jesus, and I am to bear and be that light. And I know we've shared in our small groups that we go into places that are a room full or with unbelievers in there, and when they see us, they respond because they know we're a believer. Uh, that is our light entering the room, if you will. And they respond to that light that is Jesus in us. So he was not the light. He did not go to bear witness of himself. <clears throat> Which means it's not about you. 
However, don't we act like it's about us. Because when we're in a situation and we feel like this is a great opportunity to share Jesus, what's the first thing that goes through our mind? Me. What will they think of me? What if they reject me? What if they like what I'm oh. saying? What if they are offended by my words? What if the response to me is, isn't it? We are sent to testify to Jesus. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. And if we approach it that way, who cares what they think about me? Who cares how they treat me, for that matter? The whole point of God putting me here is to represent and to talk about and testify of Jesus. However, I think oftentimes we get caught up in ourselves. Maybe it's our ego. Maybe it's our shyness. Maybe it's our self awareness, self centeredness. We can use some harsher terms. I don't want to say do that. But in reality, are we being selfish when we enter the situation and think only about me, how it affects me, how I look, what will they say about me? It's not about me. I am not the light. It's about Jesus. When they reject the message, they may be rejecting me, yes, but primarily they're rejecting Jesus and his conviction, his presence, and his light. Remember John 3, 17 and following, the light came to the darkness, but they <laughs> loved the darkness and rejected the light. So they will reject our message and us because we represent the light. So John was not the light. His testimony was not about himself. It was about Jesus. John the prophet. What is a prophet? Well, in the Bible, some prophets tell the future. Isaiah did. Uh, the prophet we know definitely always speaks for God. Thus saith the Lord. The prophet proclaims the word of God, the written word of God, or the word given to him by God. Isaiah, Jeremiah, all those. Thus saith the Lord. As believers, do we have some responsibility as a prophet? And I say that because the last couple of weeks I've heard the statement, but I'm not a prophet. So I don't have to speak. But I want to clarify. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, the offices of the church, if you will, are listed by Paul as gifts, pastor, teacher, prophet, apostle. The prophet is a specific office of the church, a position that God calls people to serve as prophet. But what that prophet does is not tell the future. What that prophet primarily does is rightly discern and proclaim the word. You read the Old Testament prophets, they all proclaim God's word. So yes, to some extent as a believer, we have some responsibility as a prophet because we have some or a lot of responsibility to proclaim God's word. So yes, we do have the authority to go out and say, thus saith the Lord, as a believer, because Jesus is inside us, is one with us. So we have that responsibility, but again, there is a specific part or office in the church called prophet. Often that's mixed in with pastor, teacher, but not always. It could be an elder in the church who has that gift. So that is John. That's his testimony. That's the basis we want to build on and how it goes from there. And, and you read 15 through 18. John testified about him and cried out saying, cried out is also that perfect tense, meaning he constantly was preaching and teaching and sharing his testimony about Jesus. Also I want to point out in verse 15, um, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. That existed is also that perfect tense. Jesus always was, always is, and always will be. I emphasize that because John's testimony is giving the basis of who Jesus is, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How are we to testify for Jesus? The story we are to tell, and this comes from Charles Spurgeon. I've used this outline multiple times at Christmas time because it's a great way to, to approach sharing my faith and my story, my testimony about Jesus with those around me. The story we are to tell, first, it is a story we have experienced. If you're gonna share your faith, share your faith, not somebody else's. It's your story, personalize it, make it about you. Well, careful there. Make it about you and Jesus and how Jesus changed your life. But it needs to be your experience, not somebody else's. It is a story of what God has done. And, and if I'm gonna share Jesus, Yes, it's how he changed my life, but also it's about how God so loved the world, he gave his only son. 
to down the cross to remove my sin, that sin barrier, so I can now be in the presence of God. So the story, my testimony, will be about what God has done. Not about what I've done, because all I've done is said, yes, Lord. So we want to emphasize what God has done. It's a grateful story. Uh, you read in Luke 2, the shepherds rejoiced when they heard the message. They rejoiced even more when they saw Jesus, the baby. So it's a story of gratefulness. We are very grateful of what God has done for us. That's not a story of, I can't do this anymore. I have to do this now. It's a story of gratitude, of how God saved me from my sins. And we're going to tell this story as poor, lost sinners, not judgmental. The people I share my story with are lost. They're living in sin. They have not comprehended salvation or a need for forgiveness. They're in darkness. They may love their darkness. I can't judge them for that. So I need to approach the story that I'm sharing about Jesus humbly as a lost sinner just like they are. Why should we tell the story? And I like the first response. How can I not? If I've met Jesus, he's come into my life, taken away my sin and freed me and brought his light into my darkness, and I am in the presence of God, how can I not share that with those around me? I look for every opportunity I have to share Jesus. I'm waiting for someone to say the right word, ask the right question, whatever, so I can talk about how much Jesus has done for me. How can I not tell people about Jesus? Why should I tell the story? To edify the body of Christ. Jesus is the reason for the season. And, and we live in a culture that has made great, great mm. effort to erase Jesus from Christmas and make it all about holidays or some other religious holiday, but not about the reason we had Christmas to begin with and that is Jesus. So I want to tell the story of Jesus at this time of year because I want to edify the body of Christ. I want the world to know the truth. It's not about anything but Jesus. But also, why should I tell the story? To communicate I'm concerned about your soul. Don't know the lost person realizes it, but when a believer takes the time and the effort and the risk to share Jesus with them, the reason is I'm concerned about the eternity of your soul. I know there are some folks that may be putting notches in their Bible, another one and I have led to Jesus, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, our motivation and attitude is to be because I really care about you. And they need to know I care about them. When I present my testimony, talk about Jesus, I need to make sure I'm communicating I'm doing this because I'm concerned for you. And, and in, in these days, which I think are the last days, it's an added topic because the end is near. I won't take this time to talk about it with you. I'm concerned about you. And then third, how is the story told? Tell it truthfully. Tell your story, not someone else's. Again, emphasis on what has God done for you? What is God doing through you and in you? How has Jesus changed your life? And there's a, an outline of my life before I met Christ, how Christ got my attention, how I showed my life to Christ, and my life now living in Christ. And that basically is how Paul shares his testimony. So I truthfully tell my life before, how I got saved, and after Jesus. Tell it humbly, not as a preacher, but as a friend, or as a child, or as a parent, as a neighbor, as whatever. Um, never want to enter the conversation holier than thou. Never enter the conversation uh, with all my memorized verses blasting out of my head. Because <laughs> that doesn't necessarily draw them to anything. They want to hear your story if they want to listen at all. The Bible definitely can be used to support my story, but they want to hear truly how has God changed me. So humbly, I'm going to explain and stress how God has changed me. Then tell it earnestly. It's not a joke, so don't joke about it. It needs to be a serious conversation. We may break the ice joking around, but once we get into the message of Jesus, we need to make sure we are focusing on the truth and telling it earnestly, not humorously. And the fourth one, which I think is very, very important, tell it alone. When I'm sharing the gospel with somebody, be one-on-one. -on -one. Because in a crowd... There's always going to be somebody to add to 
or subtract thinking they're adding to what you're sharing. Try, if you can, get them off to the side and share it with them alone. And for them as well, they will more likely to respond if they're not being watched, but also they need to have one voice in their head, Jesus, not multiple voices, mine and five other people, tell them what to do and think how to move. <clears throat> so try and do it one-on-one. -on -one. And then last, tell it devoutly. Spend time with God praying about them, for them, and yourself before you go and wrestle with them to share Jesus with them. Be prayed up. Make sure you're walking with God. And this time of year, we are busy. We have parties every weekend. We're going left and right buying gifts. Make sure we maintain that quiet time. Make sure we maintain that time alone with God because we need to be walking with Him as closely as possible if we expect and hope to be actively pursuing the opportunity to share our faith. I want to make sure I'm walking with Jesus. So I hear him lead me to the conversation. I hear him lead me how to ask a question, approach a question, so that I don't offend. So I let the Holy Spirit guide the conversation. It's not me and my anxiousness or my eagerness to do it. But it's God and the Holy Spirit leading the conversation and drawing them to him and the word of Jesus. So I want to make sure I'm walking with him daily so when the opportunity arises, I can speak clearly and effectively. And to some extent, plan ahead. Why not? You know who, who in your life you'll see in the next five weeks, four weeks? Plan ahead. Um, plan how you want to approach them, how you want to share with them. Uh, make sure you understand what you definitely don't want to say because they'll misunderstand that even if what you say is true. Make sure you're prepared and plan ahead. But at the same time, trust God that he will give you the word at the moment to speak. Christmas season is always a great time for us to shine for Jesus. So let's do it. Let's do our best to be that light in their darkness. And, and, and currently, with our economy being a mess, with our world being a mess, with literally everywhere things are happening and wars are being talked about and threatened the light of Jesus is definitely a great positive answer to world events today let's pray and father I pray you will use us this Christmas time to be a light for you to be a witness for you to be a voice for you Father, open our eyes to those around us who are lost who are desperately in need for a savior and who are looking father give us that attention and discernment to know this person can care less but this person genuinely wants answers and i pray you will give us the wisdom to know what to say when to say and how to say it and i pray father you will fill us with your holy spirit and speak through us and father i pray for those we know who are lost draw them to you convict them prepare their hearts for your word that you'll bring to them through us in jesus name we pray amen, amen.